afternoon. I'm Pat Thurston. Um, yeah, I guess the big, big story uh, over the weekend is the apparent suicide of Jeffrey Epstein while he was in his uh, prison cell. This was just, I think it came three weeks after his first reported attempt suicide, although Epstein never admitted that he tried to kill himself after the first one. Epstein said that he had been attacked, and then he went through certain psychological evaluations that allowed him to be taken off of suicide watch, and he wasn't being watched at the time that the suicide, apparent suicide, uh, took place, because that's the big conversation today. Was it really a suicide or was it an involuntary suicide? Joining us right now is David Katz. David Katz is former assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California. David, thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. I should also mention that you are now a criminal defense attorney because I think it's important to look at you as a person who looks at things from a variety of perspectives. You know, you, you represent people who have been accused of crimes and you also have prosecuted people uh, who were accused of crimes. So what about this strikes you um, at first blush? Do you think that uh, Jeffrey Epstein actually killed himself? Well, uh, um, I, I do on balance. Uh, I think that the most likely outcome after all the investigations is that um, he was extremely despondent about the situation he found himself in. He's over 65 years old. It was pretty clear he was facing the rest of his life in prison um, and that he was looking for an opportunity, at least when he felt very despondent, to kill himself, and he found an opportunity. He was not being properly guarded that would certainly be a source of investigation, yeah. why he wasn't on suicide watch when he supposedly had tried to commit suicide just three weeks before. So it was all extraordinary. And I can say, based on my experience on both sides, I've had uh, clients who were in solitary confinement. I've had them in administrative detention. I've never had anyone who attacked themselves. But you do see from time to time people commit suicide in jail. There was a famous one here in Los Angeles in the federal prison about 20 years ago. And there's, I think her name is Sandra Bland, the woman who got pulled over in Texas, remember? For yeah, just I do. Right. Yes. She got hailed into jail. That was another case that was extraordinarily controversial. And I'm sure some people will disagree with me, but I think a lot of people thought when it was all over that she had committed suicide. She was so despondent in her cell, and of course they should have taken a lot more precautions, and they didn't. But we do see this from time to time, but in such a high-profile case like this with someone like Jeff Epstein who had so much to tell, the man who knew too much, right. it's extraordinarily suspicious. Yeah, and, and there is that because um, uh, some people have uh, opined that he, the only way that he would have potentially been able to save himself or get a, a reduced sentence that still might have kept him in prison for uh, uh, 10 years would be to start naming names, would be to start cooperating with the prosecutors in some capacity. And that, you know, faced with that potential, uh, it even, and then still looking at 10 years in prison, most likely, so he wouldn't get out till he's about 75, that he really just thought that the odds were against him, that he may as well just end it uh, now. How difficult do you think it is? Have you been in these um, shoe cells? Do you know how difficult it is to take your life there? Well, actually, um, I do know something I never would have thought I would have, uh, you know, as a young science student and then comparative literature major, I wouldn't have thought I would know so much about the shoe and <laughs> administrative segregation in federal prisons. But I do. I've actually been in that prison several times uh, about eight or nine years ago, the one in Manhattan. Uh -huh. And I've been in the one in Los Angeles. Um, but what's supposed to happen on a suicide watch are a few things. Number one, you don't have things like your belt and your shoelaces. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have anything that you could use to hang yourself because that's an obvious way that someone would try to kill themselves. Also, you're in a cell which is configured in a way that the architectural fixtures and so forth don't lend themselves. There's no light. There's no sharp things that you could hit yourself against. Um, 
But he was not in a cell like that, Pat. One of the mysteries is why, supposedly three weeks ago, he either got attacked or tried to commit suicide. But then on July 29th, after that happened, he was taken off of suicide watch. There's supposed to be a psychologist who certifies in a um, post-release memo or a contemporaneous memo why you're supposedly not needing suicide watch. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to look at where was that psychologist, where were the guards. Now we're hearing that the guarding situation was terrible, that people were working way too much overtime. Why didn't we hear that from uh, Attorney General Barr before that? Barr and Trump are in charge of the prisons. His allegations against the Clintons are laughable. Barr and Trump control the federal prisons. Why wasn't Barr doing more? You know, Pat, I thought Barr's legacy, his awful legacy, would be what he did with the Mueller report, how he hit it over the weekend and issued that four-page letter. Guess what? This will be the second thing on his legacy. How on earth did he and the Bureau of Prisons let this happen to Epstein, who should have been preserved at all costs? They should have moved heaven and earth to make sure nothing happened to him. And here he committed suicide, allegedly, on their watch. And if it wasn't suicide... It was much worse. It's much worse of a scandal for Barr, Trump, and the prison system, the federal prison system. In those, um, in those units, those shoe units, do they, um, I guess that's uh, redundant to say shoe unit, isn't it? But uh, um, do, in the cells there. Special housing. Special housing unit. Right. Do they, um, do they have uh, uh, electronic monitoring within those cells? Um. You know, it depends how upgraded they are, but the suicide watch ones, which is the one that he should have been in, that's different from the regular shoe. The shoe can be any kind of administrative segregation. It's what police officers are put in so that other inmates don't attack them. Very high-profile inmates, not necessarily as high-profile or as who do as much as Epstein. But that's the special housing unit, the so-called shoe. But then there are these suicide watch cells. That's what he was in. That's what he should have remained in. And those right. have 24-hour video surveillance. Right. Video surveillance. Someone's supposed to be watching at all times while he's awake, while he's asleep. They're supposed to be logging his entry. They're supposed to be consulting with psychologists. Now, one thing, I mean, let's ask all the questions. And I don't mean to second-guess anybody, but I don't mean to, as uh, Mueller said, I don't mean to exonerate anybody. His own attorneys did not ask on July 31st when he was in court and asked for other things. Epstein's own attorneys didn't ask that he remain in that uh, suicide watch unit. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be because the client said, don't ask the judge for that. Don't make waves. I don't want to be in that suicide watch unit. Mm -hmm. It was awful to have that camera on me 24 hours a day. Right. But history will record that they did not ask at the hearing on July 31st, after Epstein had been removed from the um, uh, from the from the special unit, did not did not ask for that relief. And another weird thing about this case is that reporters who saw him in court on July 31st mm-hmm. said he did not seem to have signs of being attacked or of a suicide attempt earlier. Mm-hmm. So that all needs to come out in the wash. And hopefully it will. Hopefully there'll be a real thorough investigation and not a whitewash. What what happens now with the uh, case? I believe the civil case can go forward. They can simply uh, sue his estate. But what about the criminal prosecution? Is it dead now? The criminal prosecution is dead. Any forfeiture actions taken under criminal indictment are also dead. Mm. I imagine what they'll do is they'll turn around, the government will, and file a civil forfeiture action Mm -hmm. against some of the property that they wanted to take under the criminal forfeiture. But the criminal charges, the criminal forfeiture, all of that is dead, along with uh, Epstein being dead. And, you know, here's the irony. We always say that it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that it's such a huge burden to prove a federal criminal case. We heard that why it would be so hard to prosecute uh, Trump's son and Trump's son-in-law because it's such a supposedly huge burden. Mm -hmm. But here's the reality. There's a lot of civil claimants who find it a lot easier to wait around and hope that the federal prosecutors get a conviction, and then they come in behind that conviction and say, 
the government proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt, it's certainly a good case beyond just a preponderance of the evidence. I basically win on liability. You mm-hmm. can find liability just based on the criminal conviction. Oh, no kidding. One of the reasons that all of these alleged victims are so upset is because they can't just come in behind the conviction. They'll have to go to court, and Epstein's estate will fight back. No one's going to pay them off to make a side deal, I don't believe, uh, and no one's going to be ashamed the way Epstein would be ashamed to even try to put on a defense, innocent right. until proven guilty or not. But an estate would just say, we don't owe the money. And there'll be people like Wexler over at um, a, a, a Victoria's Secret who'll right. say, wait a second, there's $40 million there? That's my $40 million. That's the $40 million he embezzled for me. So this is going to be a huge free-for-all trying to get the money uh, that's left. And, of course, Epstein may have greatly bragged and exaggerated how much he was worth. Right. Who knows how much there really is in that kitty. Yeah, but the the value of his properties, I mean, that's at least in the tens of millions of dollars. You would think that that house would be, but again, Wexler and other claimants may have a uh, claim against that east side luxury townhouse. It's supposed to be worth $60 million. Yes, that, that's a huge chunk of change. But once people start claiming, I was embezzled, this right. happened, this was a fraudulent transaction... Uh, and then just the claimants themselves, there may be dozens. For all I know, there may be over 100 yeah. claimants, if you if you believe the allegations. But remember this, the allegations are not proven. Right. The ones proven in Florida State Court from 10 years ago, those were proven. But I'm not sure how much restitution comes out of them. You need to prove these charges right now if you want to get uh, a civil recovery. And it's going to be an uphill battle for a lot of those claimants. Well, let's go back to the the criminal case against Epstein because um, there were they, they were the prosecutors were charging conspiracy that there were other people who were involved in this sex trafficking ring, and they have said that they're going to continue pursuing those. One of the people, of course, was um, I can't remember her first name, but her last name is Maxwell. Um, she's the daughter of a media mogul, um, uh, and. She she was his girlfriend, but she's also claimed to be the procurer of these young women. And there's, uh, from what I've been reading, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that she was the person and accusations without uh, corroborating evidence, at least that I've seen, that she was the person who actually went out and found these girls and brought the girls back for Epstein to look at and decide if he wanted them to do those sex massages on him. And ultimately, the ones that he then had performed sexual acts on his friends? Well, a lot of it may depend on the statute of limitations criminally. A lot of statutes of limitations in the criminal field are only for five years. And uh, so, you know, one of the things about the indictment, uh, which civil libertarians like myself noticed, was if you look at the indictment against Epstein, there wasn't any act, as I recall, alleged within the last 10 years. Now, some of the statutes of limitations as to him went back for over 10 years. He was in a conspiracy that went back over 10 years. There's, there's certain efforts, uh, either through the racketeering laws or just through some of the statutes of limitations have been expanded criminally. But some of the folks that they are going after, the alleged accomplices, will have two things going for them. And again, I'm a criminal defense attorney. I'm looking at it from the perspective of how could they defend themselves. I have no preconceived notions of whether they're guilty or not, except we do have a presumption of innocence. So under the law, everyone has to presume them innocent, uh, even with all of these scurrilous accusations made against them. So one thing, they may be too long. They may just be too old, and they can't be brought at this point criminally. The second thing is that those folks are going to say, with the death of Epstein, there went my best piece of evidence. Epstein would have cleared me. Epstein would have helped me. Epstein would have taken the stand and said he never told me what he was doing. He kept me in the dark, even if he was doing something illegal. I didn't know what uh, that was going on. I thought they were models. I thought this was for Victoria's Secret. Uh, They'll have defenses like that that they'll say, now I can't put them on. And why? Because the government didn't preserve the evidence. The government had sole custody of Epstein, my best piece of evidence. Right. And instead of preserving him and keeping him alive, they negligently, or worse, allowed him to be killed. And that's why, Judge, I've been denied due process. I've been denied a fair chance to defend myself 
because my best witness died while he was in government care. All and right. the judge will have to deal with that. David, um, hang on with me. I'm going to take a break, but let's kind of um, uh, go from there. I, I do want to talk about what the liability the government may be facing here. Um, there are some people who are even speculating that Epstein's estate could sue the state of New York or the, the prisons, the Bureau of Prisons or the Department of Justice or somebody for wrongful death in the case of Jeffrey Epstein because of their responsibility to take care of him and make sure he doesn't die in prison. We'll be back. My guest is David Katz. He's a former assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California. He is now a criminal defense attorney. You can join us, by the way. The number is 8080-810. We're talking about the death of Jeffrey Epstein, and you are listening to KGO. There was no way that this guy was not going to eventually um, kill himself because he had few options. You know, everyone knows Jeffrey lived his life. He um, didn't want for anything. You know, the cars, the boats, the planes, the helicopters, the islands, the homes in Europe, the homes here, and the girls. That's his life. He cannot live in a two-by-four concrete cell. It was never going to happen. And I, I think when the information came out yesterday, when the court records started to be released, I think the only option he had at that time in his mind was, listen, either I become a government witness and flip against all these people that helped me get girls and flip against all these people that I supplied girls to, that's the only way I'm going to get a reduction in sentence. And it's the only way I'm ever going to get out of here. And even looking at that, he probably figured or, or he was going to do at least still 10 years. He would be in his mid-70s when he got out. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Thurston. That's Mike Fiston. He's a former Miami-Dade police sergeant. He's been chasing Jeffrey Epstein as a private investigator with attorney Brad Edwards for the past 10 years. He, of course, was disappointed in the suicide because he wanted Epstein to face real justice, as were many of his accusers who were uh, very upset about this and federal prosecutors as well. But Jeffrey Epstein's dead. And, uh, you know, somebody's responsible for that. And, uh, you know, normally in suicide, you say, oh, my God, that's too bad. That person really didn't want to live. Tis tisk. And you put the responsibility pretty much on them. When you have somebody who is in federal custody, however, there are people who are putting the responsibility of this on the Bureau of Prisons, on the people at that specific prison. And uh, joining us, my, my guest here is David Katz, who's a former prosecutor. He's also currently a criminal defense attorney. And what about that, David? Um, is there a case to be made? Are people going to be suing the state of New York for Jeffrey Epstein's death? Well, I think it's possible that they'll sue the federal government. I think that this was an area of exclusive oh. federal jurisdiction. Oh, yes, of course and it, it was. Not really much the state could have done about what happened in the federal prison. But, yes, they'll certainly try to sue the uh, federal government. I, I'm not sure that the witnesses could say that, uh, or the alleged uh, um, uh, victims, uh, th th I don't see how they were really hurt. I don't think that they would, uh, they can still prove their cases in civil court. And we talked about the fact that as a practical matter, it's much more difficult for them. But I don't think that their claims would go anywhere. Now, people may be appalled to hear this, but the executor of Jeffrey Epstein's estate could turn around and sue the federal government and say the federal government was negligent. Yeah. The federal government's negligent in a hospital and you're harmed, uh, you can sue at the VA hospital. If you're they're negligent in a federal prison and you committed suicide, I guess somebody could say that uh, they have a claim. I mean, they have an uphill battle, and there's also offsets that the federal government may have against the estate. That uh, So I, I don't think that that's the real fear here. I think it's a more interesting question what the police officer from uh, Florida mentioned uh, about his only option was to become uh, an informant. You know, I'll tell you what, David, I, I need to take a break. So let's come sure. back. Let's address that. And then also our phones are starting to jam up with people who want to talk with you. So we'll get some phone calls as well when we come back. But first, we'll talk about what that uh, police officer, what that detective, former detective in Florida had to say. Uh, my guest is David Katz. We'll get to your phone calls as well. So stick with us. 8080-810 is the telephone number. We're talking about Jeffrey Epstein. And we'll be right back on KGO.
He tried a few weeks ago. I was very surprised to hear that they took him out of a suicide cell because even I knew, and I'm sure a lot of other people figured, that this guy's going to try to commit suicide. And, of course, he was successful. Well, I think he's only been back in the regular cell for two or three days now. I've been chasing this guy for 10 years. I was very happy when he got arrested. He was finally going to stand trial. You know, some of the hard work that I put into this case and the hard work that Brad put into this case was going to be used in this trial. And I, w I was pretty happy to see that happen. And I was a little angry that he, again, in his own way, escaped justice. That, uh, again, was Mike Fiston, former Miami-Dade police sergeant, uh, now a private investigator. He's been chasing Jeffrey Epstein as a private investigator, along with the person he referred to, Brad. Uh, Brad Edwards. He's been doing this for 10 years, and this was part of his reaction to Jeffrey Epstein's suicide. And so uh, we again are joined by David Katz, former assistant U.S. attorney uh, in California, uh, and Jeffrey is also a criminal defense attorney currently. So uh, I'm sorry, David is a criminal defense attorney. Jeffrey Epstein is, is now right. deceased. <laughs> Not Jeffrey. No, not Jeffrey. No, heaven forbid. So, David, um, you wanted to give us some of your perspective on uh, on on what the um, former police sergeant had to say. Well, yes, as a white collar criminal defense attorney, so much of the the art of this is in what order you do things. So, I'm not finding fault with um, Epstein's attorneys. I think they thought they had a pretty good motion. Uh, to get this entire case dismissed. Now, again, that may be astonishing to some of your listeners, but remember, nothing seems to have happened within the last 10 years, and he had a plea agreement down there and a disposition in Florida about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and they claimed that this was covered by the agreement. Now, I always thought that was far-fetched because normally one U.S. attorney's office doesn't bind another one mm -hmm. in another location. But at least it was worth the argument and putting it forward, because right. if he had been promised that nothing would be brought forward in another district or as to the allegations from years ago, these allegations in federal court, the charges that just died with him, were from over 10 years ago. They were not recent conduct. Mm -hmm. Some of the civil claimants are claiming more recent conduct, I believe, but not the federal indictment that just died along with him. Now, once you bring those motions and you determine, let's say, that those motions really are not valid, uh, not just the judge rules against you, but the discovery that comes out shows that there's not a basis for them where you think you're going to win on appeal, mm -hmm. that would be the time to make a deal. That would have been the time to think about Epstein flipping and telling on all these other people. Mm -hmm. But he was at the initial stages where the motions and the request to obtain discovery were much more coming to the fore. And right. so that's why where the detective says, how come he wasn't flipping against people? He didn't just have the option flip or fight. He had the option bring motions, get discovery, find out what the case is all about, right. and then flip or fight. At that point, it might have made a lot of sense. You look at Sammy the Bull, remember, right. who had information against John Gotti, admitted he killed over 15 people and got a five-year sentence. Right. How could a mob assassin right. get a five-year sentence from a federal judge right there in New York? How could that happen? Because he had such valuable information. It stands to reason Jeff Epstein had incredibly valuable information uh, and could have traded it, I think, for quite a sentence reduction. But I don't think the case had really gotten to that stage yet. And there he, I mean, at least it's an apparent suicide. You know, the autopsy has been done now. And the initial, uh, more than initial indication is that it was suicide. I know that's not good for the conspiracy theorists, but it looks like it was suicide. Now, did someone turn the other way? That's a live question. But it looks like he did die by his own hand, Epstein. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I heard I have a report here this morning that says that the medical examiner is not giving a final conclusion yet that um, the results, she said, will be delayed. Um, it was conducted on Sunday, not released. A cause of death pending further information is what she says. I'm wondering if that's toxicology because it does seem like toxicology takes longer than a day. That, that may be, but I'm saying the initial reports, I right. believe, were that there's nothing, at least at this point, that's inconsistent with suicide. It doesn't right. look like 
somebody attacked him or knifed him. Remember, if there's no video and he had no cellmate, right. all of which is weird under protocol, yep. uh, anybody could have, I mean, anyone could have killed him and made it look like suicide. Of mm-hmm. course, someone could have killed him, made him look like suicide if there's no cellmate and there was not the camera uh, on him, not the videotaping 24 hours that should have been occurring. Yes, there's a lot of room for speculation. All right, let's get some phone calls here, David. 8080810 is our telephone number, 8080810. We'll start with Susie, who's calling from San Jose. Susie, hi, welcome to KGO. You're on with David Katz. Go ahead. Good afternoon. How are you guys? Fine, thank you. I think it's very interesting that all of this is just a coincidence that a couple days after, no video, um, he had all this opportunity, as you just stated, like with the mafia, that he might have all this information on government people, but all of a sudden he committed suicide, nothing gets let out, it's all left to whatever, whoever wants to um, protest against him or whatever, that, that that's what it's left to. I think that he is still alive. He is a very rich man. He can buy his way out, or the government decided to kill him because there were a lot of people that um, he had names on a list to reveal. Um, okay, h- h- hang on with that, Susie, because I know there are a lot of, of people who are positing a, a lot of theories uh, concerning Epstein's death. But it is true that part of what was seized in the raid of his house uh, in the safe were not only a whole lot of pictures that he should not have been in possession of, of not just naked women, but naked uh, girls, people who were underage, but there were also a bunch of CDs. There was, um, according to at least one report, there was surveillance uh, equipment within the uh, his his residences themselves, where he was um, filming people in compromising positions. And so, you know, this idea that there could be uh, something nefarious or people who would like to see him dead, I don't think that's wrong. I think there are a lot of people who would like to see him dead. Uh, whether they would have the access, the capability, the power to be able to accomplish that in a federal prison, I'm not so certain of. So, David, you help me out. You understand these federal prison systems. Tell me this, because I'm hearing this a lot about he's not dead. Um, when um, d- today, and I'm not talking about years and years ago, I'm talking about today, the protocol when you do an autopsy, isn't one of the first things they do to positively identify who the uh, cadaver is that they're now dissecting? Well, I don't generally believe in conspiracy theories. I must say that this one is so extraordinarily weird, and how could Barr and the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Prisons let this happen? I get that people are suspicious, but here's the problem with the Epstein is really alive and being hidden somewhere. There's a body. They can examine that body. There's going to be DNA. There's going to be everything else about that body. It's not just a government person. There was also Dr. Baden. You know, he's famous since the O.J. Simpson case. He was brought in by the attorneys for the Epstein estate, and so he was also a witness to it. He will have samples, and so I think we're going to be so certain that it was Epstein's body. Um, I could see one that he somehow escaped and that they couldn't find him, but this would not be the way if you were going to spirit him away and he were still alive. You have to produce a body, and they have the body, and the body is going to show that it really is Epstein and he really is dead. Okay. Uh, Let's go to Keith. Keith is calling from Petaluma. Keith, hi. Welcome to KGO. You're on with David Katz. Go ahead. Hi, David. I just want to say, I I look at this, and Pat, too, I look at this as a classic example of what's called confirmation bias by everybody on all sides. I I have almost no conspiracy theorist in my DNA, metaphorically speaking. But (laughs) within five minutes of reading this story on Saturday, I went on my Facebook page and I wrote, quote, the odds of a high-profile inmate like Epstein on Suicide Watch actually doing the deed are smaller than a subatomic particle. To quote the church lady, how convenient. (laughs) Okay, so I've sat with that all weekend long. And this is such a good example of how to think about how to think. I, by positing that it was unlikely to be uh, happenstance, I am then moved, if I don't catch myself, Mm -hmm. to try to confirm it by pointing to all the things that support that. Whereas science works by saying, okay, I'm, I'm suggesting it's not accidental. How would I go about disproving my own theory? Right. 
But and so you know what? what? At this point, based on everything I've heard, I'm far more inclined to say that either some guard turned his back because he hated Epstein, or else he turned his back because they're overworked and tired. And Epstein is one smart dude. He's been a liar all his life. He right. probably convinced everybody, I'm not on suicide risk. Trust me. What about this? Let me let me give you a, a different scenario. What if? Uh, what if uh, people in, in these very high-profile positions, what if they convinced Epstein to kill himself? That it would be better for him and for everybody else for him to just go away. That if he continued is, to pursue this, yeah. it would be much, much more difficult for him, and they would ensure it. And, well, Pat, and, and I could... Oh, great. Can, can I jump in, Pat? Because yeah. that's the godfather. That's the godfather exactly. where the conciliary <laughs> goes to the federal prison where he's completely secure, and he convinces them that he has to do uh, what the ancient Romans did yeah. and sort of save the family. I'll tell you what's wrong with that theory. Okay. I don't think anyone was acting as a conciliary. I think Epstein's attorneys were really on Epstein's side. But he did have a roommate. Country. He did have a cellmate for a short period of time. And, you know, that guy could have been the guy. That cellmate, though, was apparently not his cellmate at the time. Now, again, I no. agree with the caller that a lot of strange things could happen and you could certainly conjecture that that that, that the guy is a you know he's an assassin. Uh, you know this is all allegedly. This is all speculation. And right. that this guy had already killed four people. Why not kill a fifth person? Somebody's taking care of him or his family yep. for or, doing that. Or, or sending a, a message. But just sending a message. I just, I just don't think that that's what happened. Yeah. I, I do think that if if Epstein wanted to get out of this thing and he weren't having despondent moments. Right. He would have gone through his motions uh, like a lot of people do. He's not the first very rich person to find themselves in jail and to have to deal with it and to get through it and then either make a deal or have a good lawyer make motions and go to trial. There are people who've won trials, people in a lot of trouble who haven't been uh, convicted at the end of the day. I'm fortunately someone who's had a few clients like that who've been in this kind of peril, not committed suicide, not gotten despondent. And, and either gotten a great deal at the end or been acquitted at the end. And like I said, you know, there, uh, Epstein might not have had much of a chance, but, you know, he was presumed innocent. And from what we know now, they were old charges. They might have been brought by a lot of people. We'll never know what his criminal defenses were because he's dead. And that's the shame of Barr. That's the shame of the Bureau of Prisons that uh, the Attorney General and the Bureau of Prisons didn't keep him alive. Don't you think it's also queer that this was a guy who really didn't have the bona fides to be teaching science in a school that was headmastered by Bill Barr's father? And then he got he got you thrown out. That. You need to say that again. I'm not sure all of your uh, listeners <laughs> know how unbelievably tied in Barr and his family are to Epstein. Yeah, right. And, and also to organized crime and to Roy Cohn. Uh, and Roy Cohn himself ran a, a sex blackmailing operation as part of their, and this he admitted to this, which was part of, he claimed it was part of the anti-communist crusade that he was involved in at the time to get people to confess. He would put them into these compromising situations with what he called child prostitutes. They were boys. Uh, and it was quite effective for him in order to get confessions. Um, listen, David, I got to take one more break. So hang on with me and uh, we'll continue this conversation as soon as we come back. David Katz is my guest. We're talking about Jeffrey Epstein and you are listening to KGO. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Thurston. David Katz is my guest. We've been talking about Jeffrey Epstein. And before we take another phone call, I said a mouthful as we were going into the break. Uh, David, did you want to address any of that? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I think that you hit, you hit some of the nails on the head very well. I think a good point that you made was that there's going to be an awful lot of information coming out, even though Epstein is now dead. Mm -hmm. There's going to be these surveillance tapes. There's going to be all kinds of records that he kept at the time. There'll be Freedom of Information Act requests that will pry some of this information out. All the civil claimants will be getting discovery. 
some of that discovery will be probably under sealing orders, but some of it always leaks. Uh, the FBI and some of these other agencies are known for leaking. You remember during the Hillary Clinton campaign how much stuff was leaked uh, that hurt Hillary from the New York uh, FBI offices. Remember that? Yeah, uh, it seemed course. like all of Trump's operatives seemed to know an awful lot about that investigation. So things will be uh, trickling out, and uh, there'll be an awful lot to learn going forward. And some of the uh, malefactors, uh, some of the people who might have been involved in these alleged crimes by Epstein, uh, their, their, their day will come. You know, there's one other thing, and I know we're at the end here, but uh, Donald Trump has essentially, because of what he retweeted, he accused uh, Bill Clinton of being involved in uh, Epstein's death. Um, does Clinton have any recourse against Donald Trump? Well, first of all, that's a farce. Last time I looked, Trump, not Clinton, was awarded the Electoral College votes and made and made president. Uh, she might have gotten three million more votes, but she didn't win the election the Clintons don't control any aspect of the government, certainly not the Department of Justice. That's firmly in the grip of Barr. Um, so, uh, uh, no, I mean, it doesn't make any sense for Clinton or Trump to sue each other. All it does is, right, all it does is create another circus. And uh, you know what they say about, uh, you know, don't argue with, with Trump. If you argue with a pig, uh, you get down in the dirt and the pig likes it. <laughs> It's been great to talk with you again, David. Thank you so much for giving us the benefit of your expertise, and we'll talk with you again soon. It's a pleasure. Great to talk with you, Pat. David Katz, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California, currently a criminal defense attorney. Listen, we're going to continue talking about uh, Epstein. So if